Recall that uh, Newton defined this quantity of motion, which we now today call momentum. We denote it by a p as the mass times the velocity. Okay, you guys remember that? Yeah, I think so. So the whole idea is that it's this quantity of motion, right? So if you've got two objects that are moving with equal velocity, and one of them is heavier than the other, right? Then you can imagine it has a, a larger quantity of motion, right? And so that would be reflected by its larger mass. Whereas if we have two bodies of nearly the same mass, uh, but say the lighter one is traveling much, much faster, right? Uh, then its quantity of motion would be larger, despite having a slightly smaller mass. You uh, may also recall that we said that Newton's second law can be stated as the net force is equal to delta P over delta T. This is slightly different than our F equals MA version of it, right? Yes. We'll talk about this a little bit more later when we talk about uh, relativity uh, in a uh, not so far off lecture. But the delta P delta T, right, it's the change in momentum uh, versus the change in time, right? Yes. What does delta P mean? Well, delta P means final mass times the final velocity minus the initial mass times the initial velocity, okay? Let's assume that the mass is the same before and after, okay? So the delta M, if you will, is zero, right? right. If that's the case, if this is just equal to M times VF minus VI, then delta P can be written as M times delta V. If the mass was not the same before and after, yeah. what might that correspond to? Imagine you're standing in a boat on the water and you've got some bricks in the boat with you and you start chucking the bricks out the back of the boat. The boat's going to start moving, that's right. But the force which has propelled the boat forward, right? You're pushing on the brick, the brick pushing back on you. Yeah. Pushing on the boat. But the net force that you'll have exerted on it will be the fact that the, uh, the mass of the boat is decreasing. Okay. Okay? If you consider just the boat and yourself and the bricks inside the boat as one piece of the system and you ignore the bricks that are flying out the back, right? Yeah. So the mass is decreasing. So you can think of this as a form of propulsion. This is how rockets work. And so I, I don't know if we'll actually get to use the rocket equation in any great detail, because again, this is a non-calculus-based course. And so without calculus, it's a little difficult to uh, derive and use the rocket equation. But we might. We might use computers to do that. Delta P can be written as the mass times delta V. So now I want you to consider a reaction force pair. Okay? So here we've got particle 1, here we have particle 2. And this I'm going to call F of 2 on 1. This is the force of 2 on 1, which will be equal and opposite to the force of 1 acting on 2. Okay? Now let's assume that these were, you know, interacting and touching at some point, okay? Okay. I just wanted to separate them so you could see that there were two bodies there. So Newton's third law tells us that F12 will be equal to minus F21, right? They're equal and opposite forces. One is acting, you know, this one is the force of one acting on two. You see? Yes. And this F21 is the force of two, this body acting on one. Okay? So don't get confused about what that means. We could write that F12 delta P over delta T, right? Delta P over delta T, which as I've written up here, this is M, well I need to put in what this, this is the force of 1 acting on 2, so this is a 1, 2 I guess we would say, no we don't need that there, just a 1, so that's mass of, oh wait, force of 1 acting on 2, okay, so this will be on 2, that's the mass of 2 times delta V of 2 over delta T, and then F21, right, this is going to be equal to, I guess we call it delta P1 over delta T, which is the mass of 1 times delta V1 over delta T. And then we can use this equality right here from Newton's third law 
set these two pieces equal to each other. This gives me that M2 uh, delta V2 over delta T is equal to minus M1 delta V1 over delta T. We can eliminate the delta T's entirely because they are the same, right? This is the same time interval. So I'll just do that right there. I'll move this onto this side so that we get M2 delta V2 plus M1 delta V1 equals zero. Well, what is delta V2? This will be M2 times V2 final minus V2 initial plus M1 times V1 final minus V1 initial. All right, it's an I. And that's equal to zero. Distributing the masses, right, and collecting the, uh, the, the final times on one side, and I'll move the initial times to the other side, we finally arrive at the conservation of linear momentum, which says that M2 V2 final plus M1 V1 final is equal to M2 V2 initial plus M2 V2, whoops, sorry, M1 V1 initial. But another way to write that, right, remember the definition of momentum is mass times velocity. This just gives us that P2 final plus P1 final is equal to P2 initial plus P1 initial. And this is the conservation of linear momentum. Okay? Okay. It says that the... And this is for a, what we call a, a closed system, okay? So a closed system would consist of these reaction force pairs. Now, it doesn't just apply to two particles that interact with each other. This could be for any number of particles interacting with each other, okay? Right. This could be a, an Earth-Moon system, okay? Okay. Uh, which obviously has lots of particles in it. So it's not just two particles interacting with each other. It can be any number of particles interacting with each other. Okay? So, you know, some of the kind of problems that we'll work out in the future, uh, you can imagine uh, an object which is whole exploding into several pieces, right? Yeah. Uh, so those several pieces would be, you know, the different particles, all of which interact with each other. In the next lecture, we'll work some simple conservation of momentum problems. It turns out to be a simplification uh, in problem solving if you can apply conservation of linear momentum. Okay? okay. So if you know what the initial momentums of uh, momenta of some particles are, and then you know something about the interaction, then you can figure out what the final state of the motion is as well. Okay? And so we'll talk about that in the next lecture. This, however, is probably how Isaac Newton came up with his third law by you know, bumping objects into each other, uh, finding Newton's third law this way. So he probably started by observing that momentum seems to be something that's conserved in the system. Okay? Okay. Uh, and then uh, gleaning from that the third law. Okay? The origins of these conservation principles. This is the first conservation principle that we've encountered. Okay? Um, the next one that we'll see relatively soon will be conservation of energy, but we haven't talked about energy yet. These come from certain symmetries, okay, okay, of the system. And it turns out that for momentum, it comes from the translational symmetry. The fact that this experiment comes out the same regardless of whether I translate my rulers over, you know, 10 meters or not. Does that make sense? Yes. So if I do an experiment, Right? I'm, say I have a, I'm on a football field, so the football field is my big ruler. Right? I do, do the experiment at, say, the uh, end zone of one side of the field, right? yeah, okay. and I translate it to the 50-yard line and do the experiment there. The results are the same. You see? Yeah. This is called translational symmetry, and this translational symmetry ultimately is what results in this conservation of momentum, but it would be very difficult to demonstrate that uh, with the limited mathematical tools that we have at our disposal at this time. Um, I will tell you it utilizes some principles uh, and techniques that we talked about when we talked about the principle of least time, 
uh, which derives from the principle of least action, which we have not talked about. And using that, you can show uh, this conservation principle. But conserved quantities turn out to be very important. Right? You can also think of them as the constants of the motion. Okay? These are the constants of the motion. I think that's all I wanted to say about that. So yeah, we'll continue on and see some examples in the next lecture of conservation of linear momentum. It should, you should at least be able to see how it works and how you can use it in problem solving. Okay?